Hi, this is Pastor Philip Nelms of Renaissance Christian Fellowship, and I want to personally welcome you to our podcast channel. We would be honored for you to like and share our podcast channel on your preferred podcast outlet and social media. Thanks for taking time to listen, and I pray you are blessed by today's message. Please stay tuned to the end of the podcast where you can find additional information about this ministry and our teaching resources. I hope you enjoy the message. All right, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn with me tonight to Hebrews chapter 13. Hebrews 13, 16 says, but to do good and to communicate, um, that word communicate there just means to give, talking about offerings, to do good and to communicate, forget not, for with such sacrifices, God is well pleased. Verse 17, obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves. For they watch for your souls as they that must give an account, that they may do it with joy and not with grief, for that is unprofitable for you. Okay, I'm going to teach you tonight what the Word says about this truth of heavenly accounting. Heavenly accounting. I've got this Word in my heart uh, I, I feel I had to bring this tonight, um, even though I know we're missing a lot of people here. Just so you know, I don't believe we're actually done with our teaching series on the glory, but I felt like the Holy Spirit wanted me to zigzag on this tonight. So hopefully we can return to the series on the glory at our next meeting. One of the messages that seems to have been lost, or at least severely diminished in the modern church, is the teaching in the Word about heavenly accountability heavenly accountability and while I'm a big believer in grace some of our modern grace teachings have left the body of Christ with a false idea that as long as we're saved then we will never have to stand and give an account for our lives but nothing could be further from the truth I mean it is plainly stated all over the New Testament and we'll just touch a few of those scriptures tonight that we're going to all have to stand and give an account to Jesus of the things that are done while we're on this earth. All right, And so with the knowledge of this, then there does come this time for heavenly accountability. Then we should all live our lives in such a way that we should not have to stand before him and be ashamed on that day. And just so you understand, this teaching tonight is not going to be a heaven or hell message, okay? This is a teaching about receiving our eternal rewards. I'm going to give you more scripture. Uh, 1 Peter 5, verse 1, and I'm going to read to verse 4. Verse 1 says, The elders that are among you I exhort, who I am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of of the glory that shall be revealed. Verse 2, feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, not not just for money, but of a ready mind, or you say of of a good and ready heart. Neither as being lords over God's heritage, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd shall appear, you shall receive a crown of glory that fadeth not away. And I hope to come back and teach you on that scripture a little bit more when we get back to the glory. But the scriptures here that we've opened with in Hebrews and this this passage in 1 Peter are directed towards those that are in the church who have the leadership responsibilities over the flock. Okay, so this is preaching at me. So pastors, teachers, elders are instructed that we're to lead God's people with patience and by an example. We're not to be hypocrites and just tell them to do things, and and we don't do it. We're to lead as examples and not to bully the flock, not to handle them roughly. You know, we're to treat them with uh, dignity and respect the way we would want to be treated. Let me give you another passage, 2 Timothy Chapter 4, and I'm going to read verses 1 through 5. 
Verse 1 says, I charge thee therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the living and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering or with all patience and doctrine. Verse 3 says, For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts, they will heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. But you watch in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of your ministry. Okay, again, these are commands to leaders, right? Okay, your leaders have a high calling before God, and they have a solemn duty unto you. Okay, we are called to teach and to instruct those in the church with patience, with long-suffering. But we're also told, 2 Timothy 4.2 says, we are to rebuke, to reprove, and to exhort. Okay, all of those words carry the idea of correction. Not beating the sheep, but telling the truth. Or right, even when it might be hard, or even when it might not be received. And Jesus tells his ministers that they must tell you the truth because if we don't, then we have to stand and give an account to him for that. So if we ministers don't handle you and we don't handle his word well and we cause you to stumble, then we have to answer to Jesus for it. We have heavenly accountability. And if we fail to correct you and uh, you go off into error, and you wreck your life, then that falls back on your leadership. All right, so ministry over people is not to be taken lightly. It is a high call, and it is a solemn responsibility. All right, James 3.1, this is God's Word, says, Brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers. You know that we who teach will be judged more severely. I take these words seriously. When things get out of alignment in your lives and when things get out of alignment in the church, then it's going to fall on me as the leader to address it. All right, and it's not fun, but I have to answer to the Lord for it. And when you are out of place in any area and, and I'm aware of it, then I as a leader, I have to address it. If there's something going on that's causing me concern for you and there's something going on that's bringing me grief in my own soul, right, I've got to address it. And in those times when I see things that aren't right, you know, I'm usually praying and I'm taking things to the Lord on your behalf. You may not even know it, but I'm praying over those areas that I see. But I know that when my heart gets troubled for you, it's not good. It's not good for you. That's what it said over there in Hebrews chapter 13. It says if you're living in a way such that it's bringing grief and sorrow to your leader, that's not profitable for you. Let me read it again. It's verse 17. It says, Obey them that have the rule over you and submit yourselves, for they watch for your souls as they that must give account, that they may do it with joy and not grief. For that is unprofitable for you. Okay, don't cause your leaders grief. All right, when your leadership is dealing with grief over you because of your actions or your behaviors that are in error, that is not profitable for you. All right, when you're living and you're doing things that bring joy to your leaders, that is to your profit. Okay, when you live your life in a way that you're bringing joy to your leaders, you are sowing joy to them, and you are going to reap joy. This is just, again, all about sowing and reaping. I'm shifting gears just a little bit. Luke 16, verses 1 and 2. This is just the start of a parable of Jesus, and it starts this way. And he said unto his disciples, There was a certain rich man who had a steward, and the same steward was accused unto him that he had wasted 
his goods, who was wasting his master's goods. And the master called him and said unto him, How is it that I hear this of you? Give an account of your stewardship, for you may no longer be steward. We're talking about heavenly accounting, right? All right, one of the areas that I, as a leader, struggle with sometimes on your behalf is this area of stewardship of finances. Here in the church, we teach you nearly every time we meet about the importance of kingdom stewardship in finances, and giving and generosity and having a heart for the advancement of the kingdom of God. Because when the Lord blesses you, he has asked of, him, of us as his church to steward some things on his behalf while we're here in the earth. And he has asked us to at least steward a tenth of what he gives to you for his kingdom. And don't use that portion on yourself. Okay, you own the 90%. But then he said, if you will just faithfully steward just the 10% of your earnings for him, then his blessing will come over the rest of it. And we've, we've taught on that many times. Okay, and that's not just an earthly blessing, but it is accounted for you in heaven, and it is remembered and rewarded back to you eternally. So what you do in this life sets you up for eternity. This life is the shortest thing that we will ever do. But what we do for Jesus in this life will be remembered and rewarded for all eternity. You see, you can gain heaven by the blood of Jesus, and yet you can lose eternal rewards. Okay, I didn't say you would lose heaven, but you can lose rewards that you were going to gain that would have increased you for all of eternity. Those that steward his things well in this earth are going to be rewarded to rule and reign with him, with Jesus, forever. All right, and because of this truth, this revelation, okay, this thing, as your leader, as your, as your shepherd, it always is setting on me to teach you about it, about what the Word says about stewardship about finances, about using what you've got in the earth to properly finance it here for, for the kingdom. Not because we are looking for an offering from you, but because we want you to get your full reward. All right, and as your elder, it falls on my shoulders to see to it, as much as it lies with me, that you get your full reward because then I get mine too. We're tied together. All right, we win in this thing together, and we can lose in this thing together. Now, every year in this ministry, in all ministries, we are required by the laws of our nation that we are to give you a full accounting of your financial stewardship for that previous year. So everyone in this church who has ever given anything to the ministry in this past year should have already received from us a statement documenting what your, what your giving was. And if you didn't, you need to please see me outside of church and I can fix that for you. But as a church, as the leaders, we are required as stewards over your giving to give you an account of those gifts. And heaven is, is no different. Heaven is the exact same way. Uh, we humans, we leaders who are humans... We can make mistakes in our accounting. All right, it happens. But heaven never makes a mistake with accounting. There are records that are written in heaven that record your gifts and record your service to the kingdom, and those records are perfect in every detail. The Lord doesn't miss a thing. Okay, and those records will be remembered on your behalf for all of eternity. And so when you stand before Jesus on the day of accounting and the books are opened and an accounting of the things that you did in the earth will be reviewed in heaven. And from that accounting, each of us are going to receive our reward from Jesus. I'm going to say it again. This is not 
about salvation. Salvation is based on a finished work at the cross that you've received by faith. But rewards of assignments that are rewards for all of eternity. Okay, it's about your future job assignments working for Jesus and working with Jesus. Okay, we won't read it again tonight, but the parable of the talents is a parable about this heavenly accounting. And it says that the one who stewarded his master's resources well is going to be given authority over cities. The one in the parable who had gained ten talents for his master was given rule over ten cities. And then there was one who gained five talents for his master, and he was given rule over five cities. And then there was one who gained nothing, and Jesus said he was cast out, okay? But, but in his accounting, Jesus said to the person who'd only been given one talent, the master said to him, you know, you could have simply put that one talent in the bank, and you could have gained some interest on it, and you would have not lost your reward. Okay, he doesn't miss a thing. And the things that we think are too small, he he catches every detail. He he is not a heavy taskmaster. He doesn't ask you to do things that you can't do. He just asks you to be faithful with what he gives to you. So everyone has something in this earth, big or small, that we're supposed to steward for him. Well, when you're giving in church, when you're tithing, Okay, tithing is just like putting your money in the bank and gaining some interest on it. You don't have to do all the work. You just have to faithfully partner with your other brothers and sisters in the body who, for, for others who are already doing kingdom work. You're partnering with them. And the scripture says that we all are supposed to steward this a portion of what the Lord has given us. And 1 Corinthians 4, 2 says, Moreover, it is required in stewards that a man be found faithful. Okay, faithful, what does that mean to you? Now, I don't, I don't have this in my notes, but, but faithful means you're full of faith. Okay, so you're doing this because you have faith. But the other, the other side of that, it means you're trustworthy. It means you're consistent. You're hitting it every time. That's faithful. All right, all of us are given some type of stewardship responsibility in the earth. It's not all equal. We have different responsibilities based on where we are. Okay, but one of the truths from the word is that the Lord has promised a reward, okay, earthly and heavenly, a reward for those people who from their hearts will give generously of their resources. For the kingdom. And according to the word, we teach this often, all right, that tenth is is considered by the Lord a a fair standard for the body of Christ from which the Lord expects us to show faithful stewardship. The percentage is, is he he, he requires, he asks you for a percentage because there's a fairness to it, okay? It's not about how much. All right, it's not about, uh, it's about equal sacrifice. All right, so if there's, if he asks you to steward a tenth, if you only earn a dollar, then if you faithfully give 10 cents, you have stewarded his tenth well, and you will not lose your reward. And if you've gained $10 million, then he wants you to faithfully steward the tenth. That's, you know, that's a million dollars. That's a lot of money. But it's equal sacrifice. All right, that's not equal money. It's just equal sacrifice. There's a fairness to it. So, you know, we teach you these principles of financial uh, stewardship in our ministry almost every time that we meet. And we do that because it is such an important foundational principle of the kingdom. But one of the dangers of hearing lots of teaching on something is that your ears can get dull to it. All right, and if you hear something all the time, but then you don't do it, then the Word says that you fall into deception. You fall into deception. So James 1.22 says, Be doers of His Word, not hearers only, 
deceiving your own selves. Because just because you've heard something over and over doesn't mean you've, you've done it. And so if you hear every week about giving and tithing or giving the tenth, and you don't actually do it, then what happens is you are becoming deceived. And you actually think you have something or that you're doing something, you know, just because you hear about it over and over. But if you hear it and you don't do it, it brings deception. And one of the jobs that falls upon me as the leader is to point it out to you, to point out deception. Not to point it out to everyone else, but to help to be your eyes and your ears for any blind spots that you have in your life so that you can make adjustments and you can get freedom and you can gain the rewards of heavenly obedience. It is not just about earthly rewards, but there are people who will be ruling and reigning in heaven simply because they faithfully handled unrighteous mammon, is what the Scripture says. That's money. And there will be those that will suffer a rebuke and loss in their heavenly accounting with Jesus because of unfaithful handling of money. It really does matter to him. Okay, so tonight, what I want to do, I just want to arm you with one more tool to help you in this area. We're talking about accounting tonight. All right, when you work your job, okay, and usually you will have at least an annual review where you're going to sit down with your supervisor and you're going to go over your performance for that prior year. And hopefully, you know, you've done things well enough and you've excelled in that prior year so that you will receive an increase and in promotion. How many like to get promoted every year? Okay, well, in those meetings, if there are areas where you've fallen short, then that's an opportunity to address your weak areas and to look for ways to improve. And it is to your supervisor's advantage that you excel in your job because when you do well, it's going to look good on them and they get rewarded. Okay? And being a leader in the church is exactly like that. We either rise together or potentially we fail together. All right, so here's a suggestion. I'm going to give you a practical suggestion tonight on this. I'm suggesting that at this time of the year that you have a meeting with yourself, maybe your spouse, and with the Lord. And take that statement that you get from ministries that accounts for your giving. So get your, get your statement, get your giving statement that comes from your church every year. And you look at it honestly and with an open heart before the Lord. And then with that, armed with that information, you ask yourself and you ask the Lord, Lord, did I faithfully steward my giving this past year? Now, if you will do this at least once a year, and if there's weaknesses and there's problem areas that he shows you, then you have an opportunity to make adjustments. So then next year, you can be more successful than the last one. This is about our success. All right, and this is how we judge ourselves. Jesus said in the Scripture, judge yourself, you'll not be judged. That's all you're doing, okay? You're, you're looking at where you are honestly with Him. All right, and this, this is what the Lord wants from mature sons and daughters, Okay, instead of just waiting for the final heavenly accounting with him after you die, if you do annual reviews on earth with him, you have a chance to change things. So don't just do an annual review. How about a six-month review? Or better, how about daily reviews? How about before you go to sleep at night? Go, Lord, review the day with me. Is there anything I need to have dealt with today? And he'll tell you. The quicker that you can address problem areas, the more successful you will be here on the earth. And the quicker that you make adjustments, you will avoid costly mistakes that can save you from years of setbacks. So if this is your church, if this is where you give, 
then here's my advice. I'm going to give you an example. This is going to be the simplest example. Okay, I'll, I'll address some other comp- more comp- complicated examples. But, all right, let's say you attend here. Attend here for years, year over year. And in January, you get your accounts in. You give here. And so you don't give anywhere else. This is where you give. All right, so when that accounting statement comes into your hands in January, this is what you do. Take a look at the number on the paper. Now add a zero to the end of the number. Now, the number that you get, does it at least equal your annual earnings? If that number, if you add a zero and that number equals or exceeds your annual earnings when you added the zero, congratulations, you were a faithful tither for that year. So in other words, what it means is that you at least stewarded 10% of your earnings for the Lord and for his kingdom. And he said there will be earthly rewards and heavenly rewards for that stewardship. He never forgets. And there will be promotions available to you, just like with your supervisor. Okay? Now, if you do that math and your number falls somewhat short of what your annual earnings were, then you know there's room for improvement. And if you'll be honest with yourself and you'll be honest with the Lord and you will make the adjustments, you will see quick reward come. All right, I have never seen the Lord not quickly move for people when they make those changes in the area of tithing stewardship. That's just simply what it means to repent. All right, it means turn, make the necessary change. It's not about feeling guilty and sorry and, and whining and crying. It's, it's, it's going, this, this is not right. I'm going to make the adjustment. Now, maybe your annual giving goes out to more places than just this ministry. Maybe you give to multiple ministries. It's not much more difficult. This is what you do. You get your statement from every one of those ministries. Just add up that number and, again, put a zero on the end of it. And then compare, just like you did before. All right, now maybe you were someone who made some changes to your giving in the middle of the year. Awesome. All right, don't get under condemnation. This is not about that. I'm I'm just giving you a tool, okay? If you weren't giving like you should early in the year and now you are, praise God. Stay faithful in it. All right. God saw you when you made the adjustment and and he will reward you. Okay. Again, I'm just trying to give you a tool. All right. This is not, please don't get into condemnation. This is about being honest with ourselves. It's about real world accounting. Some people, they give throughout the year. But when they do it, they aren't being, they aren't taking time to be uh, a good accountant of, of what they're doing when they're doing it. So maybe they're thinking, I'm giving, I'm tithing. And if you, and if you ask them, they might honestly say, hey, you know, you say, hey, where do you give your tithe? And they go, oh, you know, I, I, I tithe at such and such a church. And here's the thing, they, they do give, they are giving. But because they haven't actually kept good accounts, they're thinking that their giving equals tithing all right but tithe literally means tenth okay there is no way to know if you are unless you have a good self-accounting so this is something you need to follow every time you give you need to be thinking like this every time you give i'm trying i'm not being legalistic tonight i promise you We're, we're going somewhere all right there's giving and there's generosity that goes beyond the the tenth and, and I promise you it brings increase and in reward here on the earth and in heaven. But tithing, this thing of stewarding the tenth, treating it like it's God's and not yours, it needs to be a baseline for everyone. And if you will be faithful with that little amount, that percentage, whatever your percentage is, then God can and will increase you to make you a ruler over much. I didn't say that. Jesus said that. Heaven keeps perfect accounting records. And they do that for your blessing. All right, because Jesus said, I will never forget the good works that you have done for me. But we also have to be keeping an account for ourselves so we can have real-time, real-world measurements 
of where we are in our own walk, in our own stewardship, so that we can make adjustments early when we need to. Because the quicker that the adjustments are made, the quicker that you'll begin to see the benefits of those adjustments. Now, this, honestly, this topic, is, it is not my favorite thing to teach on. There's other things I'd rather be teaching on. And one of the, the reasons is because it can be so mis, easily misunderstood or people think you are trying to abuse it, twist it. I get it, okay? But if I don't put the Word of God in you about this and you miss your reward because of it, it falls on me. In the Old Testament, God told the prophets that if, if God gave the prophet a warning to tell someone and the prophet held it back and that person suffered a loss or they died, then God said, I'm going to hold the blood of that person to the account of the prophet. All right, so it's, it's always been like that. Us, we as leaders, were held to an account, just like you're going to be held to an account. We all have accounting before Jesus. And when you understand that his accounting is meant for your reward and not for your harm, then it will help you to do the right thing all of the time. It will help you to be consistent. It will help you to be faithful. That's all I'm doing tonight is trying to give you some tools to help you in this area to be faithful. Renaissance is still in its early growth stages. And there is so much more in front of us. And every step of the way is going to require increased resources. I, I don't know about you, but I can't wait for the day when we're in a larger place and we can open our doors wide to the public, to more people. All right, and I can't wait for the day where we have that world-class music ministry and recording studios and film studios and art and dance ministries. All right, and these are all things that the Lord has called this ministry to. But we won't get there without you. Right, you cannot take the attitude of, you know, well, I don't need to give because someone else will do it for me. Nope, God intends to use you. If you're in the church, it applies to you. Don't think this is about somebody else. And now the more you're faithful to give and to steward what the Lord has already given you, the more he will be able to bless and, into, and to increase you. And when he does, then you're able to increase your stewardship. You see how that works? All right. It is a victorious kingdom cycle that he wants us to walk in. All right. But the more you withhold more than what you should have, it will open the door for the enemy to rob you even of what you have. That's Malachi 310, right? And if you get robbed, you will not have anything to give. And maybe you'll be asking the church for help. And you know what? We will help you. But what happens is that the ministries of Jesus Christ will suffer and you will slow things down. It can be frustrating to leadership when we see people not getting this revelation and, and not walking in it, e even though we, we teach it a lot. Because we know when you get it, then the increase comes to you, but it comes to all the church. And the kingdom advances more quickly. Your stewardship matters much more than you think it does. Now, if you started well in your giving, but you have slipped and you've drawn back, use this season to evaluate where you are and make corrections. Maybe giving more scares you. It takes faith. It means you're going to have to trust God. But your faith pleases God. Hebrews 10.38 says, The just will live by faith. And if any man draws back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. So you don't want to, you don't want to decrease. You don't want to start something and then start drawing back. That's the thing he really doesn't like. He wants you to grow and increase. We shouldn't go backwards. You should be doing everything in your power to find ways to increase in your giving. And if you haven't yet come to the place of this, this faithful stewarding in just the tenth, you need to start there. Start there. And then as the Lord increases you from that obedience, 
you will have opportunities to increase again. I'll give you an example here. Lynn, Lynn and I are going to Florida in a week to attend this, uh, to, to attend the Greater Faith Conference with my spiritual father, Keith Moore. And, uh, and last year, we attended this conference. And when we got there the first night, you know, I sat down in the church uh, before the sessions began. And, you know, I was just looking around at the people, minding my own business. I wasn't praying. I wasn't thinking anything. And the Holy Spirit came and interrupted me. He spoke to me. And he said, Philip, I want you to increase your giving this year by another 2.5%. We, I'll just say we were already over the tenth by a good amount, okay? But I heard him very clearly. I wasn't asking it. You know, I kind of wanted to turn around and go, is that you, devil? You can get behind me, Satan. All right, but I, but I knew his voice, and, and we did it. I turned to Lynn, and I said, I just heard the Lord say this. And she goes, okay. She, she's very quick. Like, if, if I say the Lord, I have to be careful. If I say the Lord said, she's just like, okay. I like that about her. And so I can honestly say that this past year, personally, we have done better with finances than in most years before, even though we were giving more. And, and Lynn and I agreed again together at the end of this year, or 2021, that we would do the same thing. I said, let's, let's do it again. Let's increase our giving by that same percentage. You see, this, this thing about the tenth is your starting point. You need to get there. Okay, bring your faith up to there. I plan, my goal is to get to where my giving becomes more than what I keep for myself. That's my long-term goal. If you're in a business relationship, a partnership, ownership of the business begins at 51%. I want to get to the place where I can say the Lord is getting the 51. He's getting more than I am. Because, you know, if the Lord is blessing you with multiple millions every year, you can live quite comfortably on the 49%. Remember, it's about kingdom rewards, heavenly rewards, heavenly accountability. Okay? But it begins with the tenth. You'll never get to that place if you don't get to the tenth. So if you learn to be faithful with that little portion, he will increase you and he will trust you with more and more. Some of you, you are one financial gift away from your increase and in your promotion that you've been asking for. Okay, the things that you've been asking for will break through suddenly if you will just decide in your heart to tithe. And like I said, tithe means tenth. If you look at your statement and, and you do that calculation for the previous year and you say you're tithing, and, it, and the math doesn't work, don't be deceived. If you're not tithing, just say, I'm not. There's room to grow. Okay, I, I'm not condemning you. I'm just saying, you're not going to grow if you don't look at it. You have to look at it. Here's another thing. He doesn't want anyone to bully you or put a gun to your head and make you do it. This has to come from your heart. You have to get revelation. You have to love him and his kingdom enough that you go, you know what? This matters more than me. It's got to be done willingly, and it's got to be done cheerfully. You have to have full buy-in on this. I cannot come to you and teach you these things and put you under a, a load or compulsion. I'm told I cannot do that, and I will not do that. Because I could maybe say or do things and manipulate things to make you do it. And if it's not from your heart, you still wouldn't get the reward. This is about the heart. I definitely, my goal is not tonight in this to berate or bully anyone into doing something you don't want to do. My goal is to teach you the word and then give the Holy Spirit a place to talk to you, to quicken you about this and soften your heart. You see, some of you have gotten calloused in your heart about this. And it's because you've resisted the promptings of the Lord for so long that it's caused a callous to form in your heart. Okay, and so what you, you don't need actually more information. What you need is some doing. That actually, the information has worked in a way because of your resistance to cause the callous. So just more information won't fix it. You've got to have revelation. You have got to have heart surgery 
from the Lord. So this message tonight, all right, well, I'm, I'm trying to be patient. I'm just trying to gently teach you the word. Like the Lord said, that I, that's, that's my responsibility. But just because I can say it kindly doesn't mean that this should not be taken as a rebuke to some of you. Remember, the scripture said, as the leader, I have to rebuke, reprove, exhort. And, and that's, that's what the message is about. You know, sometimes, you know, like, I, I love messages where we, you know, we get excited and we leave all pumped up. Sometimes you need to hear a message and you leave in tears. Not, not tears because someone beat you up, but because the Lord is dealing with your heart and the only proper response is tears because he showed you something. He pricked your heart. You know what? Last week when we were in worship and I was standing over there behind that table, I was just singing and worshiping. I didn't really have my mind on anything in particular. And it's like the Holy Spirit. It's like Jesus walked up and tapped me on the shoulder. And he started to speak to me. Now, he started to talk to me about going to this upcoming conference, which is in a week. Well, I had already told Lynn, you know, maybe a month ago, that I had no intention of attending that conference again this year. It's really, it's just, there's a bunch of stuff that's been going on. There, there's a lot going on in our life right now. I didn't think from schedule so that we really had the place to do it. I, you know, money is a little bit tighter. We're right after Christmas. And to be honest, when we went last year, although we got a lot out of it, we faced a ton of spiritual opposition on that trip. It was tough. And honestly, I've, I've got a little, I had a little bit of a bad taste in my mouth from last year. And so what, when he began to tap me on the shoulder and talk me about it, the first thing I realized is I had shut my heart off about this. And I had become unwilling. Okay, and second of all, I never bothered to ask Jesus about it. I just said, nope, we're not going this year. You know, just because something seems inconvenient doesn't mean that the Lord is not asking you to do it. I, I heard Pastor Keith Moore say just a few minutes ago, we were listening to something. He said, you know, the Lord has never tapped me on the shoulder when it came to giving. And he said, hey, Keith, is this a good time for you to give? He doesn't look at where you are because he sees things differently than you. He knows even if you're in a tight place, if you'll obey him, it will break things open and the increase will come. He will not ask you if it's convenient. He will not ask you whether or not your money looks good and you can do it. That's not faith. But what I realized when the Lord began to talk to me, I realized I had become unwilling and that's a dangerous place to be. The scripture says the willing and the obedient eat the good of the land. Okay, well, both of those things matter. You can, you can do something out of obedience and have an unwilling heart about it. I, I, don't wanna, I wanna be willing and obedient. I, I want the good of the land. But when the Lord began to talk to me, tears just kept welling up. And I, I was trying to tell people what was going on, and tears kept welling up. And I thought, you big cry, baby, what's going on? But see, he was touching my heart. Like, I realized I have an unwilling place in my heart, and I felt it breaking, and it, and it was breaking with tears. Okay, he, in other words, he was dealing with the hardness of my heart, even in this little area. But see, the problem with hardness of heart, it spreads real quickly. If you start one place, it'll, it'll, it'll go to other areas. You don't ever want to shut your heart off towards the Lord in any area. So I repented, all right? When I, I heard him and I was like, okay, Lord, I don't know how we're going to do this. But if you want me to go right now, be, I'm willing. Now, I had the question to go, I, I see my heart is wrong. So no matter what, I've got to fix my heart. I need to be willing to do this. So it started there. Now, maybe he could have said, no, Philip, I don't want you to go. I just want you to be willing to go. <laughs> but you know what, as we, as we began to look at it, and we began to pray about it, and I said, Lord, the only way I'm going to be able to go is, you know, this thing's going to happen, and this has got to happen, and this person's got to, you know, help us, and, you know, all of these things. Well, guess what? Every one of those pieces, he, he knocked into place in just a couple of days. It's done. We're going. Okay? And you know what? He is not sending me to Florida for a week to punish me. The trip and this conference will be for our blessing. 
And you know what? When he asks you to do anything, it is not for your punishment. It is for your blessing. I'm expecting great things to come out of this trip. You know, the Lord had spoken to me several years back that, that as we were in ministry, that, that he said we needed to set aside some time every year for, for personal refreshing by attending a conference. Well, I haven't done that. I haven't done that. Now, as leaders, we have to get filled up because we can't keep giving out to others if our own souls are dry. We've got to be full. And one of the things I believe I heard the Lord say to me this, this week, again, about this conference, I'm trying to tie these things together. I hope you understand. Is that he was wanting us to go back this year because he wanted to pay us back for some things that had happened and that where the enemy had come against us last year on the trip. All right, the enemy had stole some things from us last year. And God says, he owes you some payback. So I want, I want to send you back again. Well, when it comes to the tenth, when it comes to stewarding the tithe, some of you have let your hearts become hard and unwilling. And you need to deal with your heart before the Lord. And so this is a season, this January again, when, these, when accounting comes out. This is a great time to present yourself before the Lord again all right, with the books open. And if you need to make some changes, do it quickly. I don't want to see anyone lose out on the blessing that the Lord has for you. You know, for, for us as a church, for better or worse, the size we are at right now as the leader, I have to take on some more responsibilities for this ministry that one day I won't have to do, okay? And so that includes the accounting. I don't want to do that. I, I will be very happy the day somebody walks in the door and says, hey, I want to take that off of your shoulders. Let me, let me do that for you. I'm like, it's done. It's yours. But for better or for worse, because I have to do it, you know, I, I see where everything is. I, I see where all those numbers fall. And so this is about being honest tonight. I would say about half of our group is still struggling in this area, about half. Okay, and there are those, I know you've gotten the revelation, you're being faithful, all right? And I, and I know I've, I've seen the blessing and the increase. Some of you, I've watched the Lord bless you and increase you in spite of your stewardship, and I felt like the Lord said, I increased you on credit. He believes that you'll make those changes quickly, and so he's gone ahead of you and given you the increase anyway. That's mercy. That's his goodness. But I want, to get, I want you to get this. All right, I, don't want e I don't want one person in our group to get left behind in this grace. Okay, giving, the scripture says, is a grace. It's a grace for giving. So if you have a problem in giving, if it still scares you to give the whole tithe every time, then pray to God and ask him to give you the grace to be an abundant giver. He'll answer that prayer if you'll let him. 2 Corinthians 8, verse 1. Let me read this passage. It says, Brothers and sisters, we want you to know how God showed his kindness to the churches in the province of Macedonia. While they were being severely tested by suffering, their overflowing joy along with their extreme poverty has made them even more generous. I assure you, that by their own free will, they have given all they could, even more than they could afford. They made an appeal to us, begging us to let them participate in the ministry of God's kindness to his holy people in Jerusalem. I tell you, I, I don't think I've ever experienced that. I haven't heard anyone beg me, please let me give you some more so I can help you. They did more than we had expected. First, they gave themselves to the Lord and to us, since this was God's will. This led us to urge Titus to finish his work of God's kindness among you in the same way as he had already started it. Indeed, the more your faith, your ability to speak, your knowledge, your dedication, and your love for us increase, the more we want you to participate in this work of God's kindness. He's still talking about giving. I'm not commanding you, but I'm testing how genuine your love is. By pointing out the dedication of others. You know about the kindness of our Lord Jesus Christ. He was rich. Yet for your sake he became poor. In order to make you rich through his poverty. 
Now, there, that'll mess with some people's uh, you know, arguments against the prosperity gospel. I am giving you my opinion because it'll, it's going to be helpful to you. Last year, you were not only willing. We're talking about last year, right? Last year, you were not only, not only willing to take a collection, but had already started to do it. In other words, they, they wouldn't ask for this. So finish what you began to do. Then your willingness will be matched by what you accomplish. Okay? Accomplish means results. Don't just say it. Finish it. Do it. Let me read 2 Corinthians 8, 7 one more time from the King James. It says, Therefore, as you abound in everything, in faith and in utterance and knowledge and in all diligence and your love to us, see that you abound in this grace also. I just wanted you to see that word. Jesus calls giving a grace. All right, so my point is, I want you to abound in the grace of giving. I want you to become wild, crazy, happy givers. The scripture says God loves and is pleased with givers who do so from the heart with joy. No one compels you. And that's the type of givers and giving that God will abundantly bless and prosper. Amen. Friend, if you've never made Jesus your Savior and Lord, would you please do it today? You can't afford to put it off one more minute. Your eternal destiny depends on knowing Jesus. Whatever situation you may be in, Jesus can take your life and make something beautiful of it. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father except that he comes through me. And Romans 10:9 tells us that if we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and we believe in our heart that God raised him from the dead, that we shall be saved. So if you would like to know him, repeat this prayer with me today and really mean it from your heart. Say after me, Jesus, I choose this day to make you Lord of my life. I believe that you are the Son of God, sent to the earth to pay the price for my sin by your death. I believe that you were raised from the dead and that you are alive today in heaven. Please take my life and do something great with it. Friend, if you prayed that prayer with me today and you meant it, then today is your birthday. Today is the day that you were born again into eternal life. We suggest that you find a good Bible-believing local church where you can connect with other Christian believers and grow in the Lord. Thanks again for tuning into our podcast. This message has been brought to you today free of charge by the friends and ministry partners of Renaissance Christian Fellowship. If you've been blessed by this ministry, would you please consider partnering with us to help send the gospel message to others around the world? For more information on how to donate to this ministry, please visit our Facebook page, www.facebook.com forward slash rcfworld, or you may send us an email at contactus at rcfworld.org. Again, that's contactus at rcfworld.org. You may give by debit or credit card directly at paypal.me forward slash rcfworld. Again, that's paypal.me forward slash RCF World. Thank you for helping us to promote the gospel of Jesus Christ around the world.